This is Dr. Toby Moma, your host on Health and Wellness, inviting you to watch our show this week, hosting Dr. Raman Singh. Dr. Raman Singh is the President of Medical Staff for Vital Core Medical Strategies. Dr. Raman Singh used to be the Medical Director for the Louisiana Department of Corrections. He went to medical school in India, trained at one of the best schools. He went to Nehru Medical School in near Delhi in India. Then he came to the United States and went to Bronx Lebanon Hospital for his residency in internal medicine. Dr. Raman Singh is happily married with two children. His wife is a family physician and he's going to be sharing his heart for correctional medicine. As the president of the medical staff for Vital Core, he oversees several prisons, more than 75 all across the nation. And he's going to be giving us the insight that he has used to pilot this program all across the United States. You don't want to miss it. Jesus is Lord. Amen. Hi, this is Dr. Toby, your host on Health and Wellness. Thank you for joining us. Don't touch that dial. We have a great show today. Dr. Raman Singh is my guest. Dr. Raman Singh is a correctional medicine physician who's internal, board internal medicine board certified and has served in the correctional industry for decades. And he's going to be sharing his vast experience with us. He's a father, he's a husband, and he's also currently the president of medical staffing at one of the largest um, correctional facilities, correctional medical facilities in the country. You don't want to miss this interview. He's going to be giving us his, his assimilation story from India to New York to Louisiana and how he has crisscrossed the United States of America, raised his family, and become a resounding success. It's a story that is made for the books, and I'm so happy, so proud to have Dr. Raman Singh on our show with us tonight. Thank you so much for coming. Real pleasure. And um, this is Health and Wellness. We try to educate our, our video, video viewing population on what it takes to be healthy. But a lot of them don't know what happens behind the prison doors. A lot of them watching me have family members in prison. They've had all kinds of horror stories about the correctional medical uh, situation. And people tell them things that are not necessarily true. So one of the reasons for bringing this show to them is to educate them on what correctional medicine does. As a physician, you uphold the highest ethical values. You stand by the Hippocratic Oath. Whether they're a prisoner or a multimillionaire or an orphan, your job is to provide the best quality care to those people. So my goal today is to try to bring to the fore of our audience what we do or what you do as a correctional medicine physician. So before we go on to that, let's just start with you as a background. You grew up in India. Yes. You left India in the 80s or 90s? 1999. Okay. So you tell us about India. What part of India? India is a, is a behemoth. I think it's a billion plus people. What part of India did you grow up in? And um, how did you transition from India to America? Just a little bit of an update on that. Yeah. Sure. But first... I would like to thank you for yes, inviting me to this great show. And uh, communication helps. I think it's a very important part of being a physician to share your knowledge with the communities so that they can be healthier. Mm. So thank you for doing this thank show, Dr. Mama. So. Mm -hmm. so I grew up in India, uh, northern India. India is a big country, just like my adopted country, United States, uh, near Delhi. And then I went to medical school. Mm. I had no plans to leave my country, but I guess things happen with the hindsight. And some of my friends were giving the entrance test to come to the United States, and I was just giving them company, and I ended up here. Oh, wow. And were you married when you moved here, or you got married after you got here? No, I was married. Uh, my wife and I just uh, celebrated our 25th uh, marriage anniversary oh, wow. in February. So we both came together, and actually it was a collective decision. Were you in the same class or? 
Uh, she was from a different part of India. Okay. So okay. the example I give, if uh, in India, if I'm from Louisiana, then she's from New York City. Okay. So our families knew one another, okay. and I'm just a lucky guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So give my audience a panoramic view of India, because half of them never been to India, maybe more than half. They, they, they want to know, is India, was it, was it difficult? Was it, um, was the environment cordial, homely? Were you raised in a family with a father, mother, siblings? Did you have enough to take care of your needs? How was growing up in India like from a person who's never left, to, gone to India? What was that environment like culturally and maybe emotionally? That's a good question. And I think uh, folks in Louisiana can relate more. Uh, of course, India has the second biggest population, uh, not too much land, so population density is very high. But the culture is very family-oriented. It's all about family and uh, staying together. Uh, one may not have enough resources, but everyone has a big heart to share whatever they have with people, whoever needs whatever. So most of the families are joint families. They grow up together. Most of the Indians, when I was growing up, were struggling to meet the basic needs of life. I am blessed. Uh, my father was born very poor in a farmer's family. And um, most of his childhood, he never had enough food to eat. But uh, he was obsessed with education. Wow. So he went to a medical school. He used to walk 250 miles one way on Mondays and literally stayed on the street and studying under the street lamps. And when he finished his education, then he came back to our hometown. So once again, if folks in Louisiana can relate to this. The town I grew up in, my mother's side for 15 generations, my father's side for 15 generations. Everyone grew up in that town. That's, what, that's how the India is. So what was his profession, your dad? He, he, my dad was a physician, wow. uh, a country doctor. Wow. And he started his practice in 1952. Wow. And they needed him. They loved him to death. He worked really hard. And uh, he has a big influence on my life. And wow. my problem is when I talk about my dad, I started to tear up even after so many years. And he never took money from any patient. Wow. And I used to ask, uh, Daddy, why? And he used to tell me, son, I'm going to save his life. If he has money, he will give it. Wow. If he doesn't have money, then I shouldn't even be asking. Wow. That's amazing. That's such a story of, you know, what we hear in America of the 60s and the 50s, but not currently. So you now move to the U.S. and you've raised two children so far. They are teenagers, I think. Okay. Now, how, how have you been able to maybe, so let me use the word, merge the cultures, you know, because at times you want to raise them with a knowledge of their background, but still, you know, they're in the United States. So as a parent who lived in India, how do you balance that American Indian influence on your children? Do you, do you, do you put restrictions? Do you instill it? Or do you just let them assimilate the culture that they've been raised in, which is the United States is the only culture they've really been raised in, right? That's true. And that's a great question. So here is the way it happened. I came to the United States when I was 29 years old, and my wife was 25 years old. Wow. And we were already married for four years. And we moved from New Delhi, which is the capital, to New York City. And New York City is the really melting pot mm -hmm. like you will find folks restaurants clubs from every part of the world in new york city new york. so a lot of folks knew my dad uh, back from our town and they used to invite us to these parties and we used to hang out with mostly indian doctors mm -hmm. and there were a lot of uh, gripes and complaints about american culture and i used to wonder you left your home you came so far away to a place you don't like. You are not sure where you are earning your bread. So I used to have this conversation with my wife. Unlike many immigrants, where they have no choice, they will be killed 
if they stay in their home or their living conditions are so bad that they are so desperate. You know, it's about the desperation. I didn't have those restrictions. I had really a good life back in India. So one day, my wife and I decided that we would write things down and think about it for six months. But at the end of the day, if we choose to stay in this country, then this country is going to be our home. And we will be assimilating. This flag will be our flag. This would be our national anthem. And this, these are our people. Well, we debated, debated, debated. And I can tell you, I'm not saying it because I'm here and people tend to defend what they have done. Mm -hmm. We love to travel. I want my kids to be exposed to different cultures. And I get these questions all the time when I go back to India. What makes the United States such a great culture? And here is my answer. Of all the old civilizations, French, Italian, Indian, Japanese, Chinese, where I have visited, there's only one culture where a difference is not looked down. Mm. A difference does not trigger the superiority or inferiority question that if you don't look like me, mm. you don't act like me, then you, are, you don't belong to us. This country truly teaches that difference is normal and taught me to respect the difference. Mm. Everyone doesn't need to think like me. And they may, they may be right in their own opinions. And I don't have to agree, but I can continue to respect, respect and I can more. continue to work with someone who has a very different opinion or he looks very different than me or he eats very different food. Mm. So this country, that's the difference. That was phenomenal to us. Right. So from that day, I know I'm, I'm, you know, so if you look at the experts, immigration assimilation is a three generation process. Mm. I didn't want, my wife didn't want our kids to have this identity crisis. That are they Indians or they are Americans? We had these conversations. So here is what we told our kids. We are Americans and we are proud to be Americans. You know, I stood in the line for pizza. I stood in the line to get the green card and I was very proud to raise my hand to take this oath the day I got my national American citizenship. And we are also proud of our lineage and our heritage. That's it. So my kids, as I understand, they are proud of their heritage, right. but they are Americans. They are Americans. That's a wonderful answer, and that's a, I mean, that's, that's, that, I think that answers the question of how your attitude should be when you move to the U.S. You've moved to the U.S., you need to assimilate. You can't keep ostracizing, because America is a welcoming country. They've welcomed every culture, every nation. So people should learn to assimilate, if you ask me. But talking about New York, so tell us about your experience in New York. I know you went to Queens Hospital. Bronx, Lebanon. Oh, you went to Bronx, Lebanon. Okay. And then from the Bronx, which is maybe one of the roughest parts of New York, <laughs> you, you, you transition after three years to Louisiana. Okay. Mm -hmm. So tell us your experience in New York and then why Louisiana? Well, that's a great question. It's like looking back at your life. I didn't see much of New York City oh. because in residency I was working really hard. Mm. And um, that was sixth the busiest ER in country. Mm. And um, I really wanted to be a cardiologist. And one reason because when I went to my chairman of the department in second year and I said I wanted to do a fellowship, he told me point blank that forget about cardiology, though he told me that I was really good, I was in the top 5% think about gastroenterology, and he told me that I would most likely get, and I asked why. He said, because it's impossible to get cardiology, and then he asked me what exactly I decided to do. I said, you answered my question. I'm going to be a cardiologist, because <laughs> I like to do impossible things. <laughs> well, when the result came out, I had the first seat for the cardiology fellowship, but at the same time, my daughter was born, and coming from India, you know, men work hard, and their job is to put the bread on the table and the women take care of the family. But somehow I fell in love with the child. And so I used to work 16, 17, 18 hours in a residency. You can relate to it. And I would come back home and I'd play with my daughter all the time, all the time, oh, all the wow. time. Then I was in this dilemma that they gave me this fellowship expecting something from me. 
whether I can live up to their expectation. And now I really want to spend time with this baby. Wow. My niece was graduating from LSU 2001, around Mardi Gras time, I think. We flew in to Baton Rouge, and my wife and I just fell in love with Louisiana, and that's a true story. And I Googled the job. job was in Louisiana State Penitentiary. I faxed Dr. Tarver, uh, my resume, and he called me and he said, no, I was overqualified. And he did the same mistake which my program director had done to tell me no. Oh, wow. So I said, no, I'm coming. We drove to Angola, and it was beautiful. We were done with these concrete jungles. And here I felt like people were connecting. Mm. They really meant something. Mm. You know, they were, this was a good place to raise family. And coming from Indian culture, family was everything to us. Mm. And your wife had finished her own residency then? Or? My wife had finished medical school, but okay. then she was raising our daughter. So she hadn't done her residency. So when we, I went back to Angola in 2004, she went back to LSU New Orleans to start her residency. So for oh, three wow. years, actually, I joke that I raised my daughter. She was 40 <laughs> years old, or maybe she <laughs> took care of her daddy. <laughs> Wow, that's a, that's a powerful story. That's an awesome story. And that's how you came to Louisiana. I mean, you, you're right. The first, I did my training in New York. I trained in Brooklyn. But every time I went to the Bronx, that was my exact words, concrete jungle. It was concrete. It was steel. It was glass. But there was very little vegetation. So, I mean, I don't know if I was the only one who noticed, but I kept wondering, I said, where are the trees in Bronx? I mean, it just, everything was just hard, concrete, you know, and not too much in, you can't really, you didn't have that human interaction because everybody was always running, you know, running and running. So, so tell us a bit about, um, you came here, and of course, Katrina hit in 2005. Did that change anything? I mean, you were right in the middle of Katrina. And your wife was still in residency then? Yes, actually. Wow. My wife uh, did her residency from LSU, so she was doing her OB rotation in Lafayette. And, uh, but talking about Katrina, the two days after Katrina, the Burl Kane was warden at Angola, and uh, him and I, uh, we went to New Orleans. You know, because we, you, ha you remember those pictures, inmates on interstate, and they could yeah. be evacuated. Right. And uh, they took over Greyhound bus station. We made a makeshift uh, clinic there to treat uh, all law enforcement officers. We had uh, law enforcement coming from all parts of the country to help. There was so much outpouring of the support. Right. People wanted to help. Here is the learning lesson from Katrina. The good people, they rose up to the challenge. There were some bad people. Mm -hmm. There were some gunshots going on. But I saw so much goodness, so much outpouring of love and affection, and to help one another. To me, that's what humanity is about. Mm -hmm. You know, no one knew that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, people could blame, why didn't you leave New Orleans? But it was what it was. What really moved me is that how much good people how many of them? We think, you know, we don't have enough good people were there, and they all rose to the occasion to help. But a lot of people relocated from Louisiana after Katrina, but you didn't. You stayed in Baton Rouge. I guess that's what I was meant to be. You know, Louisiana is my home, actually. What's your, what's your, what, what, what was your job at the time Katrina hit? Were you the state director for the prison? No, I was a uh, medical director for medical Angola, director. Okay. and uh, Louisiana Department of Corrections did not have a state director at that time, okay. at time of Katrina. So, but Angola being the biggest prison, me being uh, their medical director, I was thrown in the middle of it to help. Wow. And I've always wondered, how did you carry out those, and I'm not trying to say it's impossible, but it takes a nerve of steel to inject, you know what I mean, the death what they call the injection. So did you have to do that yourself? No. Or somebody did that? Uh, I can go there, but I can tell you uh, the physicians never participate in anything okay. to do with uh, execution, uh -huh. anything. So like actually yesterday we had one execution in Mississippi after a long time. Oh. And during my time frame, when I was uh, Louisiana as a state medical director, there was one execution uh, at Angola. The inmate had given up his rights 
if I recall, he had molested his stepdaughter really badly. Mm. And, uh, but physicians do not participate. It's, it's not ethical. Okay. Physicians working in corrections, it's their duty, and taxpayers pay them to take care of inmates' health care. You cannot be uh, participating in any way in execution. So another physician that I, does No physician, no, so and I don't even know that who does what. It's probably some pharmacologist or something. Wow. This is a question I always wanted to ask. Do you ever worry about your family in the correctional medicine arena? Do you ever worry that some guy in the prison may one day come out and make a attack on your private family? Has that even crossed your mind? Has that ever come up, happened to anybody in the correctional medicine world? Because I, I think people watching, they have that paranoia. You know, if I refuse to give him what he wants, maybe when he comes out, he, I might become his target or something. Maybe you can diffuse that paranoia if it's not true. Absolutely. And I'm really, that's a great question, Dr. Moma. And I'm thinking what analogy uh, will work here. So working in prison, of course, it's a very challenging environment. But being a physician, w patient care is a challenge. You have a patient who is hurting. And I hate to say this in today's world. He is struggling with insurance company mm -hmm. to get what he thinks he needs. He is struggling to pay his premium. He thinks he deserves this. He cannot get it. And when he comes to physician's office, he's so frustrated due to bureaucracy. Prison is no different. Mm -hmm. Inmates are angry. Some of them think they shouldn't be there. And they are just venting it out. Having said this, the answer is a physician has to know the science, practice the science, have very effective communication with his patient all the time and document it, and then do not worry, really. I do my job, and I put rest in someone else's hand. That's all I can do. So mm -hmm. as a person, I don't really worry. The only thing I worry is to do my job well. So what would you say to those physicians who look at correctional medicine and they're like, too many lawsuits, too much stress, too much um, people trying to control how much you prescribe or what you don't prescribe. I wrote some things here. I said, physicians said there's strains of the environment. There's maybe lack of access to mental health. That's what people say outside for um, why they don't join correctional medicine. But you've been doing this now for 20 years. So you must be an <laughs> not just an asset, but a bulwark. You, you probably are one of the longest serving correctional medicine physicians. So w do you think all this that doctors say are true, that there's a lot of unnecessary bureaucracy like everywhere else in, in, the, in the correctional medicine field, but they feel that there are, there are people who limit what you can get to, for this patient, and they therefore don't want to serve in an environment where they are overly limited in their capacity to maybe refer or send a patient for a test or prescribe a certain medicine. And then, of course, the other part is a lot of doctors feel there's a litigious nature in the prison. So what do you, what do you think of that? Once again, this is a good question, and I can certainly see why someone will feel like that, but the reality is slightly different. Most of the standards of correctional health care are defined by the courts. And the landmark lawsuit, Estelle versus Gamble, was in Texas, uh, early 70s, which defined that prisoners are the only group of people in this country who have real right to health care, adequate health care. Having said that, most of the powers to be who manage correctional health care system, they know that if they do not allow providers to do their job well, they will end up in a lawsuit uh, from ACLU, from Southern Poverty Law Center, you just name it. There are prison, prisoners advocacy groups, and they are very proactive. So the job has to be done. In my experience, this has been a wonderful experience, actually. No hassling with insurance. Uh, the limitation is lack of resources in the communities. 
one has to understand that prisons are a part of the communities they are in. So if Louisiana, before the implementation of Affordable Care Act, we had the fourth worst shortage of healthcare professionals in the country, primary care. So think about this, prisons, if the patients need to go, LSU has a long wait list for free people, of course there will be a wait list for the prisoners. Right. The challenges are huge, but as a physician, I, I liked it so much, actually I recruited my own wife once uh, she had finished uh, her residency and Dr. Moma. Yeah. So you can share your experience. Uh, so, uh, you know, my wife works in private sector now and she tells me all the time she couldn't get MRI for this patient. We feel this face the same challenge, but I really don't think there's much bureaucracy mm -hmm. uh, controlling. But however, the challenge is, unlike the free world, like we call it, where it's funded by the insurance companies, here, the healthcare is funded 100% by Louisiana taxpayers. And I take this as a responsibility mm -hmm. that if taxpayers don't get to ask me how this money is spent, I have to be a good steward of taxpayers' dollars. So there's a fine line, which we all do in our jobs. That's the right. jobs are tough. It's a walking a fine line where you don't cut back. You don't cut the corner, but at the same time, you also don't splurge. It, this is not a Cadillac plan. Mm -hmm. So people see it from the different angles and they come to different conclusions. So what I had tried to do in Louisiana, and I'm doing in Mississippi, is to find that balance that we use taxpayers' dollars effectively to provide medically necessary care. Yeah. And here are the buzzwords. I say not less than medically necessary because then price tag is high because you end up paying millions of dollars to attorneys and in the lawsuit. Mm -hmm. But if you do more, then that's also a wasteful spending. So medically necessary care. Wow, we've been talking with Dr. Raman Singh, former state director for the medical director for the Louisiana Correctional, and now working as a director for the Department of Correctional Medical at, in Mississippi. He trained at one of the best schools in India. He went to New York, and now he's based in Louisiana and Mississippi. He's going to be sharing his experience as a husband, as a father, as a, as, a, as a medical director, and how he has seen the evolution over the last 25 years. You don't want to miss his story. He's going to give us a lot of insight into what happens in the correctional medicine world. We're going to start talking about this on the next show. Please join us. Same station, same time. We're here. Write to us. Always faithandpower.org. You can find us P.O. Box 550, West Monroe, Louisiana, 71294. Join us at our Holy Ghost Night. It's coming up end of the year, December 31st, 2021, Oyo Hotel, 165, 11 p.m. You don't want to miss it. God bless you. Jesus is Lord. Amen. <music>